Okay, so we have the game up and running. I know it's clipped a bit off the bottom, but that's I think showing you everything you need to be able to see for us to to, uh, to get moving. So we're on the Wiccan branch because I thought it's a workshop route. Let's do something a bit different to normal, and uh, we want to take a train up the branch line. So let's start off with some very basics. Um, first of all, we're going to uh, I'm going to enable the uh, mesh tools, which is under Michael Whiteley, and I'm going to use the 3F. Now, let's have an um, advanced 3F, and we'll stick it in there. And then the Wagger coaches, we'll stick a couple of coaches behind it. So you pretty much want to start out your scenario exactly the way you would normally do it. All you're doing really is uh, using the script really to add a bit of an extra flavouring, if you like, to the scenario. So, that is uh, that. Now we need to add a driver. And we go into the timetable mode. Uh, and let's give him a destination up here. And I'll tell him to go to there. We must give him the final destination marker. There. Right. So, our train is now in and has a path. And that scenario should just work the same way you would normally expect such a scenario to work. Um. God, the chat's going crazy with all sorts of stuff at the moment. I um, hope you can all see this. So what we're going to do now, what we are going to do now is put in a pop-up HTML box. So let's get the first little thing in. So we're going to introduce the scenario just with a, a funky bit of HTML. So the way we're going to do that, it's um, the way you cause something to happen in script is with a trigger instruction. So if you normally wanted to pop something up, then you'd put it in here. You'd say, hello, welcome to this scenario. Um, however, we're going to do it in Bialua. We don't do that. What we're going to do instead is put a message uh, thing in here. And this is going to say, intro text. Right, so this is what's, if you look under the highlight there, it's called trigger event. So what that's going to do is to trigger an event. Hey Panda and Jaxi, welcome to the stream this evening. Um, so we're going to add a, uh, an event called t t Intro Text. Now we'll see what that does in a moment. If we go to this instruction, uh, this is a script. So we click that. Now we haven't got a script file at the moment. If you click Open Folder, and it's opened over here, so I'll just move it so we can see it. Right. So in here, we need to right click and new text document, and it's called scenario script.lua. We need to create it, yes, we do. Now, let's open that up with the notepad. Just a moment. Wow, how many files have I got open at the moment? That's insane. Right. Now, what I am going to do at this point is just see if I can't get the font size up a little bit.
Right. So we're going to zoom in a bit so that you can hopefully see it a bit better. So we're going to start off by creating a function. And there are a number of standard functions in a scenario script. One is called on event, And there's one called test condition. Don't worry about the exact seconds of them. Thanks, Ed. Um, so on event is what's going to receive those trigger messages that we just set up test condition we're going to get to so in on event I'm going to say if event that's this bit here so this is the event that was passed in equals intro oops can't type intro text right and then in here we do something so Right, bringing my cheat sheet up on the other window. What I'm going to do is I am going to play or display a message. Right, so what does this do? Um, so it's a syscall, uh, scenario manager show info message um, ext. This is the title of the message box. This is the HTML file you want to load. And this tells it that it's vertically centered, horizontally centered, it's the regular size message box, and we want to pause the game. Message, uh, put false in there, the game would carry on while the message box was up. Now, one thing that is, is this, these, num these values here don't exist by default, so we just need to make them. Uh, so if we come up here, what I'm going to do now is just paste a whole load of stuff into the top of this file. Uh, and what I'm going to try and do is find a way of putting that maybe on a blog or something so you can copy and paste it down. So what have we got? We've got false and true have been set up. These are the condition ones that we'll use later for test condition. And then empty info and alert are the type of message boxes. Info ones appear in the middle, alerts appear in the top right. Um, that tells it how to sort of where it's in the top, center, the bottom, the left or the right. And this is the size of the box, small, regular, or large. So you could change that to be message LRG, and then that would change the size of the box. But I'm going to leave it as message rate. So what we got? So a quick look. If event equals intro text, then we call that, and we're done. So we've done the Lua scripting bit. There's another bit we need to do. We've just asked it to display a HTML file. So let's create a HTML file. All the HTML files you access are localized, so you create a language folder, so EN or DL, DE or PL or FR, whatever is the, uh, the appropriate uh, local two-character country code. And then in here we create our file, which was intro message. So let's create text, intro message.html. Yes, we do want to do that. And then we bring that up in Notepad. So, um, are you right? I have missed a then, haven't I? I've been too, too much C sharp programming lately. So there's a then needs to go in there. So, and in a great big swath of cheating, I'm just going to paste it in. What is this? This is just standard HTML, and I will leave you to uh, figure out HTML. Um, but essentially, it sets up a, uh, a font that is yellow on a background that is red. Yes, that's going to look good uh, in Arial. Uh, I'm going to include an image, um, just so you can see an image on the screen. And then we're going to do some bolds and some italics and some other stuff. So that's the HTML file. So we save that out. So we've got a HTML file. Now we just reference an image. So let's get that done. This does get easier once we uh, once you get a little bit of this grounding work done. So I've got the image tucked away somewhere else. Uh, I'll leave it up to you to find your own image uh, that you want to use. Um, what I would suggest is that they need to be um, uh, 128 by 128. Is the correct is the size you want to do your images you can do bigger images but then you need to have a large dialog box so let's drop 
professor.png into there. I've just grabbed that from one of the pieces of DLC that's available. You could just do a hunt for professor.png and if you've got the uh, DLC it comes with, you'll find it. Um, so, what have we done? We have, let's have a quick recap. We put a load of constants in at the top, make life easier. Uh, we have defined on event which will receive intro text and then it will do a show info message. Type of the box, it will show a HTML file, it will show it in the middle as a normal size box. The content of the box has been set up, the image has been set up, and everything has been saved. So over here I click reload and if all goes well you don't get any problems down here. Now just to show you an example of what happens if you do make a mess uh, let's say for example I'm going to take that bracket out of there and save that and if I click reload you get a problem here and it says it's on line 26 so let's go and have a look and see what line 26 is and lo and behold it's pretty much where we are here now it thinks the problem is here but that's because it sort of was assuming that we knew what we were doing and uh, well it was wrong so we put the bracket back in press reload all is good click compile and we're done so, oh, there is uh, a fair bit. Um, uh, there, it is quite complicated daily, um, but uh, watch it slowly, uh, and what you'll find is you can actually do a lot more with the scenarios. So, having done that, let's just give the scenario a quick test and see what it does now. Save the changes. Boom! There you go. So we have a piece of HTML now loading in my glorious yellow on red text with professor.png, which I think came from the original Trains vs. Zombies, perhaps? Yes, I think it was the original Trains vs. Zombies. You'll notice the title of the box went up there with the title of the box. And uh, then the HTML file got added. And then the train decided to drive away through itself because I forgot to tell it that it wasn't a yellow train. <laughs> okay, so well, let's go and do that first. We should really tell it that it's not an AI train. Good, so we've done that. Now, what comes next? So we've learned now how to put HTML in. And that's not what I wanted. Should have used Comic Sans here. Yeah, that's the go-to. That's the go-to font. That one. That's better. Sorry about all the blinking going on. So you know what? Everyone keeps asking, how do we do cinematic cameras? I think that we need to make a cinematic camera. So let's go and do that. Where's my train gone? Up here. So. When I was playing about with cinematic cameras for this exercise, I sort of started looking at it going like that. I thought that was quite cool. But then I realised it would be better if it went the other way around. So, what you want to do when you're thinking about cinematic cameras is um, work out where you'll go, it, where you wear it. So, mock it out with your, you know, with your, uh, just with the normal camera. Because that will give you an idea of what you want to do. So, let's, now we've got that. If you go into the little bag icon, which is miscellaneous, and click cinematic camera. Um, you'll notice that if you look, look at my cursor, there's a little camera there following it. So place it somewhere that you can get access to it, and then click back on it, and then let's just move it up so it's a bit easier to see. Right, now, whatever this camera is looking at is what we'll see. Yeah. So, if we double click on this camera, we get the camera setup box in the top right. This button changes the camera so that it's pointing at whatever I can see. So let's move this, say here, and click. Now the camera is exactly where I was. So let's go roughly to where that was again. Now I want to move the camera here. So what I do now is click this button to add another frame. So you'll see this just went to 2-2. Two, two. And then I click that again. And now we have the first frame here, or the first keyframe. The second keyframe is over here. Now let's go and zoom down to the player train, somewhere about there. Add another keyframe. 
and then set the third camera. So you can see now we have three keyframes on this camera. Now, uh, sorry, just checking the chat, see if there's anything there. Right, so what else do we need to set up here? There are a couple of things. Well, the first one we really need to set up is to timing. Now, we use this uh, these arrows here to go between the two, so if we, uh, between all the different key uh, keyframes. So, if I click one, if I'm on one of three, then you can see the uh, cursors over here. If I click that, you can see we're on two of three, and if I click that, you can see we're now on three of three. So let's go back to the first one. We're going to say how long this will take. So let's set that and say we want to do that for five seconds. And that will then mean it takes five seconds to slide across here. I then want to take five seconds to slide down there. So let's do that and make that five seconds. And then for this one, I'm going to make that five seconds. So the whole cinematic sequence is going to be a whopping 15 seconds. Now, the other thing we can do is change the field of view. So if we start on a field of view of 65, which is the normal one, and then I click the second one, let's change that to a field of view of 40. And then we'll make 30 also a field of view of uh, 30, by a keyframe 3, a field of view of 40. Now, what we can do, if we go back to keyframe 1, we can test it. So by clicking this play button, we can see what it's going to look like. That's not bad. So, click stop. Until you click stop, a lot of this stuff doesn't work. So if you click play, remember to click stop when you're done. So, if we decide we don't like one of the positions, so let's say keyframe 2 is not really quite where I want it to be. So let's go back to keyframe 2 and put it more perhaps here. I then click that button again. And, everything's, and that, that keyframe is then moved. Now, you can do this the old-fashioned way by just moving them around using the arrows, but personally, I find it a lot easier just to put my camera where I want it and click the button, because uh, then you don't have to set up rotations and everything else. It's just all done for you. So let's just have a quick look at what that one looks like now. That's good enough for the purposes of this. I'll let you think about what makes a good cinematic sequence for you. Um, so the last thing we need to really think about here is the name. So I'm going to call this one Intro Cinematic. It's important you remember to spell them correctly because you're going to need to refer to them later on. So that is the cinematic set up. Now we need to start it. So if we go back to the timetable view Remember how we set a command doing using this? We need to do another one. All right, so we're going to make it so it does, the, it does a cinematic first. So let's set that one up and call that one um, cinematic. And this has no relation to intro cinematic. Hey, John one Scotland, Harry Harding, CAD, welcome to the channel this evening. Uh, so this is just going to call cinematic. Now what that's going to do is go back to our script again. So we'll come back to our script, and we'll say, if event equals cinematic, then, and here, we will do, he says, copying and pasting another piece of magic code, or trying to anyway. There we go. So let me just walk you through what this is doing. Camera manager colon activate camera, initial camera. So that's not initial camera, that is um, intro cinematic. So that is the name that we gave the camera. So Ed is asking, can you have AI moving? Yes, you can. And if so, does that count to say the first 15 seconds of the scenario? Yes, it does. Um, it all, it's all, the scenario starts from the minute it starts playing. Uh, as in the whole scenario starts playing. You can kick cinematics off at any point in the scenario you like. You don't have to do them just at the beginning. You can have them at any time you like. So, 
If event is cinematic, then activate camera intro uh, intro cinematic. Now you can actually do something else with the. Um, hey, thanks for the follow. Much appreciated. It's not telling me who. Oh, Shane Wales. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so yes, you can do other things with activate camera, and we're going to do that right after we get this one working. So we've act we've created the cinematic. It's called intro cinematic. We've called it. We've then got an event which is called from here cinematic. Nothing can go wrong, surely. Right. Hey, new image and Joshua, welcome to the channel this evening. So let's save that. Now we need to go back in here. Anytime we change it, hit reload, hit compile, and make sure all is good. If all is good, then uh, our code is mostly okay. And then we press the play button. Now, what happened here was that it looks like it started to play the cinematic, but then it's immediately popped up this box. And now the cinematic carries on. But that's no fun. That's clearly not what we're looking to happen here. What we want to happen is to run the cinematic and then pop the box up. So what you need to do is we need to add a little delay. Uh, the player train carries on in the way it's going, Ed. Uh, Irish Rail Guy, you're quite limited in terms of what HTML you can put in there. Certainly I would not expect you to be able to use JavaScript and CSS, and I certainly wouldn't expect even half of HTML to work. Uh, it's really the bare bones. Uh, tables work, uh, images work, italics and bold work. I wouldn't expect huge amounts more to work. It's not a full HTML web browser. So, um, so what, how are we going to fix this then? Let's press Control E. Uh, go back into the scenario editor and go into the timetable editor. So the problem here is you did cinematic and then immediately the intro text fires off. Now, how do we fix that? What we need to do is tell the intro text to start 15 seconds later because that was the length of the cinematic. So. If we now play that, notice nothing happens. Wait for another five seconds. And then pops up the message. So we're in a good place at the moment. So that's HTML and that's um, So that's HTML and um, cinematic cameras. Sorry, I'm losing my brain here. So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to do the cab camera switch. So when we finished doing, um, yes, yeah, so Shane, there are there, there are two or three other tutorial videos on my YouTube. Uh, details are not at the top of the screen it seems um, so if you look us up on YouTube um, then uh, someone will post the link in a minute hopefully um, then you'll find there's some scenario creation tutorials which go into sort of the fundamentals of scenario creation this is all sort of bells and whistles and fancy bits that you can add on uh, later on so now we're going to go switch to the cab so the sequence is we want to do the cinematic then we want to do the intro text, um, having switched to the cab. Thanks, Doc. Right. So, now what we want to do, so cinematic, cab camera, intro text is the sequence we want. So let's add that in. And then put that in here as cab camera. And that also needs to start at 15 seconds, otherwise what it'll do is it'll override the cinematic. So we've now got our event cab camera. Um, Pipe Sergeant, is it possible to get a pop-up message that would not pause the scenario? Yes, um, you can do that with scripting. So if I go back to our little example script here, this true, if you change it to a false, it will not pop up a message. And similarly, if you change... Um, no, I'm thinking of something else. So yes, if you just press that to a false, 
then that will change it so that it won't pause the game. Uh, you could make it a small message box and make it pop up, say, top and left, uh, and then it would be sort of in the in this uh, this sort of top left area uh, of the uh, of the screen, so it wouldn't be quite as visible. And then they naturally all disappear on their own anyway. If the player doesn't click them, the close button. Although they will have the opportunity to close if they want to. So getting back to our, what we were trying to do, we now need we've done cinematic. That's this one. We've done intro text, which is this one. Now we're going to add cab camera. So let's add cab camera. Doesn't matter what order these are in relation to where how you need them. It, it calls them up as it wants to. Uh, so cab camera. I pressed the wrong button there. What happened? Oh, I pressed caps lock as well. Excellent. So if the event is cab camera, then another piece of magic copy paste. I wrote this scenario last night, so there shouldn't be too many problems. Touch wood. Um, we activate camera, cab camera. So previously we activated a camera called Intro Cinematic, which is one that we made. However, there are a number of predefined cameras, one of which is cab camera. Uh, there are other ones like external camera, for example, so you can force it into camera two, I think that one does. Um, so we've got cab camera, we're calling it, so let's run the scenario. We just need to reload and compile, make sure the script is OK, and then run the scenario. So the cinematic plays, goes keyframe 2 to 3, 5 more seconds at frame 3, oh, and then Minicam pops up, thank you Minicam, in the cab, but then the other thing doesn't happen. Interesting. Why didn't the other thing happen? Sometimes I've noticed that when you're doing scripting, you need to come out and go back in again. It's very much the same as the signaling gets upset. So having really grown to love cinematics, if you put your cinematic in at the very start of a scenario, I guarantee you'll grow to hate cinematics because it will add 15, 20 seconds to every retest of your scenario. Right, so that's not doing what we want it to do. So let's go back to our script. I've clearly done something wrong here and I can't quite see what. Ah, welcome to the scenario. Can you finish it in one beat? It did eventually do it. I don't know quite why it took so long to do it, but it did. At 30 seconds. Ah, okay, I know what we did wrong. We added two lots of 15 seconds, which was silly. So here I've got two lots of 15 seconds. So I just need to make that zero. So, cab camera at 15 seconds, and then this at zero seconds beyond it, so that they happen one after the other. Now it should work a bit better. Cinematic. And now it all works fine. So, so we've now got a fairly standard intro to a lot of the way that um, uh, scenarios can be written. So that you've got a nice intro cinematic, you've got automatically switching to the cam uh, camera, and popping up a text box with some more detailed information. That's slightly more pretty, with a bit more formatting on it than you perhaps used to um, in the previous in the default functions. So what else can we do with Lua scripting? Let's go back into the editor. So, one of the other things I thought I would cover here, one of the many other things actually, is it's possible to pop a message box up um, so that it comes back. Um, or so that it can come back. And what we're going to do is just have a little function called uh, display recorded message. Um, so there is a, a function inside the game that caught or a concept called recorded messages, and um, the way that it works is that you call this register recorded message and then two functions: start display and something, and stop display and something. And what that means we can do 
is um, if you've seen on some of the tutorials in the HUD, they say that you can click the left and right buttons on the down on the HUD down here to be able to move back and forth between the messages and get them back. Well, this is how you do it. So you've got this display recorded message. So if in here we say display recorded message intro text, uh, actually let's, put, let's format that slightly nicer because it actually means something different. And now what I'm going to do, we're going to get rid of that in a minute, is create two functions, start display intro text and uh, stop display intro text. Now stop display intro text I'm going to leave empty because we don't need it from there. I get rid of it from there. So this is going to do exactly the same as we had before but now it's going to use this register recorded message capability rather than um, just directly displaying the message. Now you'll see that in here the actual way we display the message is exactly the same. You could put anything in here. So clicking back to a sequence could also reset any other things that you're doing in the script. So let's just see that in action. So we need to save that and recompile and run it. <clears throat> Yay, cinematics. Right, so let me say welcome to this scenario. Now notice this has all appeared and I can now call it back up. So if I close this and click that button, I can bring the message back up again. And every time you do a display recorded message, it just adds it to this list. Hey Mad Dog1420, welcome to the stream this evening. So, that's another one. That's another little tip. What I would suggest is if you are giving them any useful information, giving the player any useful information, give it using a display recorded message. If you are giving them just, you know, random information, then don't put it in there. That way, if they are, see you're giving them instructions like go over to this siding, pick up the first three wagons, then take them over, and there's a bit of instruction they have to remember, then um, what you need, to, then if you do it this way then while they're driving along, say 20 minutes later, they're thinking, oh, what was that instruction again? They click the button and it's right there and they can see it again, which is really, really helpful. So, what are we going to do now? Um, I think what we'll do is some speed checking. So, let's just start by doing a check to see whether the train is actually moving so has the player actually got the train moving yet so to do that we are going to need to do a thing called a condition so let's add a trigger and move it into position and we're going to call that uh, start moving check now remember all the start moving checks all come into here if event equals start oops, start moving check then one thing to remember is that these event names are case sensitive so if you put it with capital letters up here it must be capital letters down here um, so what are we going to do with start moving check with start moving check we are going to do a begin condition which looks like this now, oops, start moving condition. Right. What this is doing essentially is it's going to start calling test condition now all the time. Now, if you're familiar with the programming already, that basically is it's like it's kicking a thread off. It's not, don't confuse it with it, but it's like it means that you can now do other things uh, while the scenario is running without actually having an event. So, the stream doesn't seem to be doing anything. Oh, we're back again. So, um, Steve Jam, uh, I'll have a look at that in a bit for you. Let's get this done first. Hey, Dougie and Tim Rudd, welcome to the channel this evening. So, where do we get to? We create a begin condition check, and we've called it start moving condition. 
What does that mean? In here, it means we need to check if start moving condition is being tested. So what I've done here with begin condition check is I have told the game every frame please call test condition calling co with the parameter start moving condition. So this will now get called loads of times over and over and over again which means you need to be a bit careful what you put in here because this is going to uh, oops sorry um, so yes start moving condition is going to go into this so it's going to call test condition with this parameter set to start moving condition and it's going to call this loads and loads and loads of times so if you make this bad code then your scenario is going to have a very low frame rate so you just need to be a little bit careful what goes in here what are we going to put in here we are going to he says looking for the code we're going to do this I'll talk about through it in just a moment once I've cleaned it up right so if the condition is start moving condition so if it's the one that we're interested in and it's the only one so if it gets called then uh, hey Steve-o welcome to the channel if it gets called this will be the one we're gonna get the player engine speed so speed is player engine colon get speed so I now have access to this current speed in meters per second okay so we're going to set the speed. Now I set that to 0.89. Let's just make that a little bit faster. And I'm going to go with my uh, trusty friend. Ooh, hang on. Come over here. Uh, I'm going to go with my trusty friend Google. And I'm going to type in 20 mph in m slash s. And it's going to tell me it's 8.9408. So 8.9408. Um. <coughs> So, if the speed is greater than 8.9 meters per second, which is 20 miles per hour, then we call. He says, thinking, why is that there? That doesn't work there. Um, then we're going to call display recorded message moving, because we're going to pop something up when this happens. And we're going to say, we're done with this now. It's finished and it's worked. So, that's all we need to do now except we need to set this message up. Now remember rightly that was the start stop nonsense we put up here. So we created another one called moving so start display moving stop display moving so how is it called moving? If you remember we passed in moving as a parameter here and up here it says start display plus whatever we passed in so start display moving and that's how that works. So what we're going to do in here is copy that paste it in here and instead of uh, that we're going to do something jolly and moving got HTML right so um, we've just created that now we need the HTML file Where's my HTML file gone? There's my HTML file. So it's, sorry, there's my folder. So we're going to create. What I'm going to do actually is we're just going to copy intro message um, because they're basically going to look the same. And call this one moving. And then let's edit that. And I'm going to say and. Uh, Let's go in here and just get rid of that and say you're moving good luck and close the bold tag right so we've created moving we've got the scenario script set up we should be good to go Um, so let's save that. Now Ed's just suggested you could multiply the result of the get speed to get it into miles per hour. That will work as well. It's uh, really down to preference. So if I hit reload, we're all good. Compile. So you can't call end condition from within test condition. 
If you don't want the condition to work anymore, then you return condition succeeded. That's my understanding of it. If you call an end condition, it just doesn't do anything. Right, so now we need to get the train moving. In the cab, pop that up, thank you very much. So now, hopefully, in the background, it's watching what I'm doing for speed. Open the cylinder clocks, release the brakes. Throw the regulator wide open. go. Having reached 20 miles per hour, it's now popped up this message. On reflection, this message should probably happen rather sooner than 20 miles per hour, probably more like 2 miles per hour. So we'll fix that in just a minute. So let's go back in. Edit yonder scenario. Which is probably exactly what I had it set to before, thinking about it. 0.89. Yeah, that was exactly what I had it set to before. So I outsmarted myself there. 0.89, which is 2 miles per hour. So that message will now pop up once we get to 2 miles per hour, which is cool. So, what's next? What's next is, he says, finding what's going on with his system. Um, so now let's work out what happens when you go over speed. So what we need to do is kick off over speed set checking with another condition. So back in here, put another trigger in. Now I'm putting all these triggers at the top. You could put them in the middle. So for example, if you had, say, three waypoints, you could put the overspeed check starting after you've gone through the second waypoint, for example. So in here, we're going to put a thing in here, which is uh, start overspeed check. Now, I'm not going to check to see what the speed limit is. I'm just going to check to see if it's over an arbitrary number, just because that's simple enough. Um, so we're going to start over speed check. So let's go back to our script. Now, it should be used to the pattern by now. If event equals uh, start over speed check, then. And then we're going to start a condition again. Right, I'm just checking my notes to see what we do next and then what we will do is set up another condition in here so the condition we have decided to start is, this one's going to be overspeed condition and then down here we're going to look for overspeed condition get the speed and this is the one I want to be 8.904 Um, and when we do that, we, if we get over 20 miles per hour, we're going to display a recorded message over speed 1. And we're going to start looking then after, so this is called trigger deferred event. This will cause an event to happen after 5 seconds called start too fast check 2. Now, I'm going to comment that out for now. So two hyphens at the front of the line says ignore this line of code completely. So let's press uh, save on that. and uh, we can now come out of that. So we do need to create this file actually. Let's get that sorted out. So again I'm just going to make a copy of that. It's called overspeed1 and here Slow down, crazy man. 
Right, so in here, we've got display recorded message over speed 1. Now you'll remember display recorded message needs this start and stop stuff on the top. So function start display over speed 1, function stop display over speed 1. And then in here, we're going to copy the code that does the start. And the title is going to be going too fast over speed 1.html. So, that's going to link up to our HTML, that's going to be the start and the stop. We've got this fully start over speed check, which is going to call over speed condition. Over speed condition is going to get our speed, if we're over 20 miles per hour, it'll display that recorded message and then stop checking again. Okay, let's see how that works. Reload, compile and run. Now one thing I have found is that when you start using conditions you do want to come out and go back in again because um, a Mkchowski skullcap and Baba Ganushka <clears throat> so if you're using conditions you do want to come out and go back in again just to reset all of them because they don't always reset correctly and you can find stuff that doesn't work when it actually would work had you reset so, welcome to the scenario. Can you finish it in one piece? So, let's release the brakes. Put the reverse forward, cut off the forward. And then let's put the throttle on. So, when we hit two miles per hour, you're moving. Good luck. Excellent. So, we carry on going. Whoops. Getting there. Boom! So we've now spotted that you're going too fast, so slow down, crazy man. But now we're going to carry on going. And I'm, you know me, I'm just going to keep accelerating. Right, it's, it's time to put in, it's time to take measures to stop drivers like me. Yeah? So, we don't have to change anything here, but we do have to put some more stuff in the script. That's where this comes back in. So what we're going to do is we're going to trigger a deferred event that says after five seconds, launch that uh, fire that event. So let's copy that so we can get it right and go back up. Do you remember back in on event? Um, and then down here, if event equals the thing we were triggered, and then what we're going to do is start tricking, checking for a different condition. So let's look for overspeed condition 2. So, overspeed condition 2 is going to take slightly more effective measures against the player. So what's this going to do? Get the speed and see if we're back over our imposed, artificially imposed speed limit. Oh, thanks Bringe, that's really appreciated. <laughs> um, so, we're now going to display a recorded message, which I'll deal with in a minute, and then we're going to set a bunch of control values. So, even as well as I can get the speed, I can actually affect what's going on in the loco. So I can set things like any, depending on what loco you've got, these all have more or less effect. In this case, that has no effect on this loco. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm setting the regulator. Ignore the first digit because that's that's effectively an index value, which is always zero. And the second one says what value to set it to. So I'm going to set the regulator to 0, the train brake controller to 1, the virtual throttle to 0, and the virtual brake to 1. So that's going to put the regulator off and the brake on. Okay. Let's take that one out for now. Let's do this one step at a time. So that's going to do that. Now we need to add over speed 2 messages. We need to insult and abuse the player for driving like some kind of crazy person. A speed 2. Stop display over speed 2. And then we're going to put um, this one, which is going to say final warning. And this is going to be over speed two. <clears throat> now, let's go back to our explorer. Not that one. 
that one. So let's take a copy of overspeed one and call it overspeed two. Edit that. I'm stopping this train, you crazy person. This is your final warning. No. Oh, press the shift key, thank you. Right. Oh, I've already tried it with the Jintied, so I know it'll work. <laughs> so we've made the HTML file, we've updated the script, we now need to make sure we reload and recompile, and play, come out, and go back in again. So we get our nice intro cinematic. Right. Welcome to this. Can you finish the scenario? No, I can't because I'm a crazy man. Right. So open the cylinder. We put the cut off forwards. Wait for the brakes to come off, or just put it on full forwards anyway. Right, we're moving, good luck. So he's on speaking terms with us at the moment, which is excellent. So now we're gonna wait till we get 20 miles an hour. Hey there, Manic, Sergeant Salt, and JP Mac. Welcome to the channel. So we're just coming up to 18, 19, 20. Right, slow down crazy man, too fast. So what happens now is it's gone back away for 5 seconds. So in 5 seconds time, if I'm still breaking the speed limit, I'm stopping this train you crazy man. Now notice the regulator's come off and the uh, brakes have come on. So we're going to, and the uh, brakes are slamming on, the speed is coming down. So the train gets stopped. Right, so, let's go back into the world editor. What happens next? What happens next, folks? That's what we want to know. I'm going to go back to here, go back to our scenario script. Now, down here we commented out another line, so let's uncomment it. And this does exactly the same thing we did before. So after five more seconds, I'm going to start another event. So let's go and deal with that event. And then in here, we're going to start another trigger. Three. Don't try and chain these triggers from within these. Because what happens is that you start a trigger, you try and do a return condition with the same thing, it all gets very weird. So always complete the condition, move on to the next condition via a trigger. If you make that trigger one, then it happens just about immediately anyway, if you want it to happen one after the other. I think you can even do trigger zero, which is immediate. Um, but always come back out to the event to trigger another test, another condition, rather than trying to do it all in test condition. So we started um, start too fast check three after five more seconds, having stopped the train. And now we're going to see what happens. So what we're going to do now is always be condition three. Uh, so overspeed condition three. Overspeed condition three is going to be somewhat more terminal. Hey there, PP Woodsy. Welcome to the channel this evening. So what's going to happen with overspeed condition three is, if we break our 20 miles per hour speed, we are going to trigger a scenario failure. I give up. You're out of here. Too much fast driving. And we're going to sign that dark monster. Right. So, let's recompile that. And before we do that, I'm just going to just double check we've got the right thing in here. So, we did start too fast, check three, which was there, which condition began a condition over speed, condition three, 
but checked everything and kicked us out. Good. We're good to go. So let's give this one more test. Come out. Replay. So, let's release the brakes, Jane. push it forward, open the cylinder cocks, and put the regulator up. <laughs> You're possibly true, Fringe. Anyway, so, you're moving, good luck. So we've got three trigger points now. So the first one, you just get a, a warning. I mean, that'll happen in a moment. Slow down. Now, the beam's paused, so the five seconds doesn't start until I release the button. So I click that, we get five more seconds. Right, now the brakes have come on. Right. Let's release the brakes. Put that throttle up. You can't stop me. I'm a crazy driver. I'm a crazy maniac. I'm just going to put my bottle up and forget it. And start looking at chat windows and look at my phone. Eight miles an hour. Cheers, James. Twelve sixty. Thanks for joining us this evening. Now, when we hit 20, you'll notice it now says, Scenario incomplete. I give up. You're out of here. And when I press X, that's it. Scenario's over. So by doing a trigger scenario failure, you can initiate a an early ex exit of the uh, scenario. You, there is also a trigger scenario success. So you can trigger an early success of the scenario as well. So, that's pretty much the end of what I'd pre-planned. There is one other thing I think I would like to look at. Um, but you're going to have to forgive me a moment while I look up the commands I'm looking for. So, when we first got hit by um, putting the brakes on, I could release the, the, the brakes. Let me just prove that. So, if I now get going,
I'm just going to pull away from the camera so that we can let that go. So, um, Dark actually just made an interesting comment saying that it was funny the scenario was failed by driving 20 and a 50. However, and yes, this is a bad news, this is not necessarily a good, a well put together scenario, but I'm doing it to demonstrate specific bits in a relatively constrained environment. However, it's not quite as crazy as it sounds. So, on Western Lines of Scotland, there were two or three scenarios where you're carrying um, hazardous materials like uh, you've got oil tankers behind you. Now, oil tankers have a speed limit of their own, or any wagon has a speed limit of its own, which is independent of the speed limit on the track. So, the speed limit that you can drive as a driver is based on the fastest that your train can go, which is the slowest of any wagon on the train, plus also the speed of the, um, the track itself. Um, or the speed of the track itself, so it's whichever is the um, the lowest of those. Um, in the case of this particular scenario on the Western Lines, you're carrying oil tankers, which I think had a 30 or a 40 mile per hour speed limit, but parts of the journey you were going over, you actually had something like a, um, a 60 mile per hour speed track speed limit. And what I wanted, or wanted, was to make it so that if the scenario, if the driver went over that 40 mile per hour speed limit, then they were penalised for it and ultimately they fail the scenario which you can't do the normal stuff you need to use this kind of logic yeah, I don't know if you've noticed also with all these messages they are coming up here so the train is now going to stop but while it's stopping I can just move that back to there and put the throttle back up yeah throw the fireman out the window I'm going I don't care what you're saying oops never mind that happened anyway that's exactly what it should do but what we actually want to do is get the driver to stop the train and not let them do anything. It's a bit like what happens when you do emergency brakes. There is a way of doing that. So let's go back into the world editor. Control E that was. And go into the timetable mode. So in our little script script, what we need to do we're going to need to add some extra logic. So, OSB condition 2 sets this stuff. Now, what I want to do is also lock controls. So, this will lock all of the controls from doing anything. Be very careful how you use lock controls because it will also lock pressing the escape key to try and exit the game or to pause it. So, be sparing with your use, um, but use it where you sh where where it's needed. Um, so in this case now, I've locked the controls, so you can't now do anything. The train will stop, and that's it. You basically the scenario is now dead. So what we need to do is to make it so that after the five seconds, part of start too fast check three's job in here, which is over speed condition three, if you remember. Uh, start to fast check 3 kicks off over speed condition 3 well let's also scenario manager colon uh, he says reminding himself what the unlock command is funnily enough unlock controls right so we've now unlocked the controls so in theory we'll have to wait for five seconds before we can unlock the controls that's not an ideal solution. It'd be great if we waited till the train stopped, but let's at least prove that the concept works, and then we can try and put a bit more cleverness into it. So that's done. Really? No, not that. Go away. Reload. Compile. Okay. And then press play. Quit. Replay. Hey, you man. No PP pee Woodsy. So, ye wonderful cinematic. So you could comment the cinematic out, but then all the timings would change, and you'd end up staring at the screen for 15 seconds anyway. So you might as well leave the cinematic in. So, let's get moving. So what we're trying to prove here is, once it puts the brakes on for us, can we still drive the train? Not so much UK steamy man, it's more about driving a, uh, doing a scenario, about uh, how to make a scenario, scripted scenario. So we're moving, let's keep going.
No, man, it's a rather beautiful 3F. So we're waiting until it gets to 20. So it's now saying slow down, crazy man. I'm stopping this train, you crazy person. Fine. So now it's the, the, the HUD has gone. Yeah, I've got no controls. It's that. The HUD has just reappeared. So now I can get the train going again. So while lock controls happened, the HUD vanished. Well. Right, so let's just exit from that. We've proved the point. So what we ideally want to do then is not just wait five seconds, we actually want to um, wait for the train to actually stop. So let us uh, go back into the timetable editor and bring this up. Now what we're going to do here is um, over speed condition three, uh, we're also going to check stop condition. There's no magic to these names, I'm just naming them as I go. We're not going to call unlock controls there. So having checked for stop condition, what we want to do now is if condition stop condition, then uh, let's put uh, that. Now I would not check to see if the speed is zero. I would check to see if the speed is less than 0.1. Um, just to allow for any fluctuations. And then what we're going to do is the unlock. So scenario manager colon uh, unlock controls. Right. Um, and then we're going to return condition succeeded so it doesn't do it anymore and if that doesn't happen then return condition not yet met right so that will keep that will keep the condition so once you return condition succeeded then this stops being checked completely uh, and I have the suspicion that once you have succeeded a condition I don't think it can ever be resubmitted for approval uh, for doing again so you can't redo the same one over and over again Right, so now what should happen is that until the speed reaches 0.1, uh, it won't unlock the controls. Once it gets to a stopped, or nearly stopped, then the controls will unlock. So let's try that. See this, Sergeant Salt? So we do that, we drop that. So there's an open that. So now what should happen is that once it throws the brakes on, we should not be able to do anything until the train has actually salt. Of course what I haven't done is restarted the scenario. So let's do it from there getting too excited now. Oh, we got to watch the cinematic again. Isn't it beautiful? I would definitely encourage short cinematics. Keep them prompt for your sanity and for everyone else's. Short, faster cinematics also look better than slower ones. Right. Right, there you go, you're moving, good luck, so we know our conditions are all working. So 
So we're getting up to 20 and bang, we just got our first warning. And then after five seconds, bang, we get our next warning. Now the HUD has disappeared. I mean, now we're waiting. So it shouldn't come back now. Until the train stops. And now the HUD comes back, so now I can actually release the brakes. So effectively, this is like the end. The fireman's giving me control back of the train. <laughs> Nutter. And um, I can um, I can have another go. So that's probably about all we're going to cover for this session on scripting. There are a whole bunch of other stuff, uh, things that you can do with scenario scripting. So if you set up extended weather blueprints, um, then you can uh, access those. Um, you can find out whether the train has reached a particular destination. So for example, I want to pop something up when you get somewhere. And there you go, that's the end of the scenario. So, I hope that's been useful. Um, what would be really cool is if, um, if anyone's got any ideas for what they would like to see, um, what, they, what questions they've got, then uh, fire them over to me uh, and I'll take a look. <clears throat> and... Uh, We'll see. We'll see what we can do. Maybe do another tutorial if there's other questions, or if it, if I've gone too fast and you can't catch it, or it doesn't come out very well, then maybe we'll have another go at some point. But I hope this has been useful. Um, so let me switch it back to uh, changing route.